going? Yo, make some noise for Zombie Fighter, man. That's awesome. Great job, team. Great job. Hey, man, I am pumped about this series. It's going to be in a great series, and, and I don't know if this is your first time with us or, or your 1,000th, but I just want you to know that you are home today at Radiate Church. It's a good day. It is a good, good day. It's going to be awesome. How many, how many of you guys, has anybody gotten this yet? Anybody swung by and pick, picked up? Well, I saw a couple of people drinking them. Who needs a burst of energy this morning? Who needs one, right? Yeah, some somebody right here, Christy. You got a little, you got a baby in your hands and everything. So there you go. You get some some energy. She probably don't need that. So I, you know, I uh, if you if you drink that, never mind. Anyway, so uh, we're just glad that you're here. Swing by the store, get that. It's an amazing day as we kick off Zombie Fighter and uh, all these things and and so much is going down today. And and here's what Zombie Fighter is all about, right? So Zombie Fighter. I know you look at it and you're like, what are we talking about? What does this have to do with God? What does this have to do with Jesus and the Bible and, and church and all this stuff, right? And, 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 and good, I'm glad you asked that question to me this morning. Because I want to tell you, here's what it has to do with. It has to do with loving people to life. Loving people to life. Here's a phrase that we use a lot, right? Like, I love you to death, man. But what if we just started loving people to life? What if it wasn't just this thing of, I love you because we do life together and we hang out together and we agree and this and that, but it's like, I see something in you and I want to live my life in such a way that it brings out of you what God's placed in you. What if every single one of us had an opportunity to live out a, such a call and such a purpose in our lives that it affects everybody that we're around? What if every single one of us, whether you're here today for the first time and you haven't walked in church in 40 years, or whether you're here for the 1,000th time and this is your church home, what if every single one of us, no matter socioeconomic status, no matter addictions, no matter where we are, but today we could find out that we all have a place to, a part to play in the story of loving people to life. That everybody you're connected to isn't by chance, but it's by purpose. What if that was the case? Wouldn't it change the game for us? Wouldn't we probably look at things a little bit different? What if the people that pop up on your Facebook, what if it's not an accident that they're there? What if the people that you work with, what if it's not an accident that, that you work with them, right? So last, last month we talked about what does it mean to live my best life? What does it mean to live my best life? And so we looked at what does it mean for me to pull out and live my life in such a way that I'm living my best life with God. Now I want us to move past our best life and help others live their best life. And, and here's what I believe. I believe we're in a, in a time in our society and in our culture to where we need some people that are willing to care about other people enough to help them live their best life, and it's not all about my best life. Anybody in the room today? I believe we live in a time, and let me just tell you, like, about 10% of Americans today deal with clinical, clinical depression. That's not just, like, depression that, that comes and goes and, like, bad days and go. I'm talking about clinical depression. You, you're diagnosed by a doctor. You need medicine. You need help. You need all these things. And hey, how, how about this? 70% of Americans today hate their job. How many of you guys work? Anybody work? Y'all got to wake up. Anybody got a job? Anybody? Got, all right, so y'all got jobs, right? Some of you may be in the place where I'm in between jobs. I'm looking for a job. Some of you are like, I've been looking for a while. And I just believe that God's going to bring you a job to provide for your needs this morning. But if you're in a place to where you're like... I work, I work, 70% of you in this room today hate your job. Most of you, are, a lot of you might be like, yeah, that's me right here, I fall in that, that's, yes. 70% hate their jobs. 64%, see, only 64% of Americans are happy in their marriage. A little over half of Americans are happy in their marriage. They're in their marriage because they're, they're stuck there and they can't get out. Y'all are like, this has got depressing real quick. <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it didn't. I'm, I'm laying a ground for something. 80% of Americans are in serious financial debt that they can't get out of. 
And by fi serious financial debt, it's like over $50,000. 80%. And, and there's so many more statistics you could go find, right? And so here's what all that means to me. Why am I telling you all that? Because here's what I believe. That if you add all that up, and then you add in the political climate that we live in today, and we live in the relationship stresses that happen today, because my God, we can't be in relationship with somebody unless they agree with us. And then we add in the pressures of social media that if I post something somebody doesn't like, by God, keyboard cowboys are coming out and they're going to tear me up. Because social media is giving everybody that don't need a voice a louder voice. Come on. Y'all like, mm-hmm. Right? And so you add all that up. Then not, that doesn't even count kids. And my goodness, if you got kids, just stretch your hands forward. Let's just pray together. Like, I'm just saying, like, you got kids and that's in there. And then, not to mention, if you're dating or single right now, like, I praise God, I'm not in that boat because I couldn't handle this climate like it is in that realm. And so here's my point. Like, wherever we are, all these elements, when they add up together in somebody's life, we can feel like we're running such a race that at the end of the day, we feel so dead that we can't move forward. Because we get stuck in this, in this uh, uh, rat trail of a race where we're just chasing our own tails all the time. We're just running in this. You ever seen the hamster wheels? And the hamster's just kicking and running as fast as he can, but he never gets anywhere. Somebody asked me the other day, I, I started going back to the gym, and, and, and uh, uh, the doctors have released me to do a little bit and do some running and things like that. And they asked me, they were like, you going to hit the treadmill? And I was like, I guess, because that's all I can do right now. But I hate the treadmill. And they were like, oh, yeah, why? And I was like, because you run so much, but you get nowhere. I'm still standing in the same place I was standing when I started. I'm the kind of guy, I need new scenery, I need new place, I need progress. And here's the truth, most of us are running on the treadmill of life. And by the end of the day, we feel dead. But what if, what if each of us could go, you know what, I don't have to live a life of death. I can live a life that actually pulls life out of others as well. I can love uh, myself and others to life. In fact, Jesus said it like this in John chapter 10. Uh, yeah, John 10, 10. He says it like this. He said, I came that I may give you life and life to the fullest. Or another, another example says it like this. Life to abundantly. Abundantly, abundantly, abundantly. What does abundantly mean? Abundantly means more than you can handle. So when I give you abundance of something, it means you don't even have the capacity to hold everything that I've given you. It is too much for the capacity that I currently hold. And so here's what Jesus says. I came that you may have life, not death, but that you may have life so full that the current life you're living isn't even at the capacity that you can hold the life that I'm giving you. That I want to give you so much love that the level you're on right now, you can't even hold the love that I'm giving you. And I, I don't know about you, but when I look around today and I, I look at life and I, I look at where we are and I, I look at churches and I, I look at my own self, so there's times I don't feel like there's an abundance of that. Anybody in the room? In fact, I feel like if anything, there's probably a lack. It's like, man, I, I, I don't feel the love. Because we're so quick to judge everybody and give opinions that we, we, they're truths to us. But here's the thing. Can I just tell you something? Truth doesn't change based on circumstance. If your opinion that is truth changes every time something else happens and it's not truth, it's opinion. Truth doesn't waver. Truth stands strong no matter what. That's why the Bible is called the truth. That's why Jesus says, and the truth shall set you free. Because truth doesn't move no matter where you are. So I, I just believe we're in this thing where we need more of something. And, and here, if we're going to love people to life, and you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to look at three things real quick. But if we're going to love people to life, we have to understand something. I really want to get this across today. I want you to hear me. Uh, uh, people are not our enemy. Please hear me. You're like, you may be going, oh, I know that. No, 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 hear me. People are not your enemy. The person that talks about you is not the one you're fighting. The person that doesn't understand the life that you're trying to live and they're trying to short-circuit what you're doing is not the one that you're fighting. 
The person that won't leave you alone on social media is not the one you're fighting. In fact, as we went through 20 days of reading uh, 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 the New Testament, in the New Testament, we read a chapter in Ephesians chapter 6, and in verse 12, it says this. It says, war not against flesh and blood. Paul says, don't war against people. Don't war against one another. Don't backbite. Don't, 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 don't fight. Don't go into battle with one another. You're not fighting flesh and blood. He says, war not against flesh and blood, but forces of darkness can I tell you something hear me whatever you're going through whatever you're fighting today I want to tell you two things one you're not fighting the person you're fighting the thing you're not fighting the person I know I know they did you wrong I I get it. You're mad at them because they hurt you and they're evil. No, they're not. They are just as evil as we are. The problem is, is sometimes we're not, we're not fighting a person. We're fighting a cycle that sucks us into a thing of either darkness or light or light. We can either get sucked into a cycle of our lives. And here's what I mean by that. Let me explain it. We are all good people marred by sin when we come in the earth. Hear me, we're going somewhere. The cycle that we live our life in determines the actions in which we live our life. And so here's what I mean. If I'm in a cycle of negativity and of victimization and of pain and of frustration and of hurt and all this stuff, then the cycle sucks me into the darkness of a negative mentality. But if I'm in a cycle to where I'm going to church and I'm around positive people and I'm in a life-giving mood and I'm in a mindset to where I'm thinking on things above, not on things below, and I'm in this cycle, then I begin to see things a little differently than other people. And it's not because I'm better or they're worse. It's because my cycles are different. I'm not fighting you. I'm fighting a cycle that's trying to draw me either to or away from God. Is anybody in the room, y'all? There's burst energy drinks back in the back. (laughs) Right? And so we got to understand, like, hear me. This is why we got to stop the backbiting all the time. It's not because I get tired of seeing it, because I just do. It's because we're not actually fighting each other. The Bible clearly says that a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. So therefore, if God, if the enemy can get God's kids fighting against themselves, then the family is now divided and now the kingdom can't stand because instead of moving the kingdom forward, we're fighting within the walls of the fortress. I can't go get the food that I need from the wilderness because I'm trying to kill you before I get out there. I can't serve with you because I don't like what you've done. We're going somewhere. This is hitting something today. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting a force of darkness. And so that's why it's so important that we understand that the way we treat people draws them into a cycle. Draws them into a cycle. Why why can we love people to life, Pastor? Why can we love the purpose out of people? Because I want to love somebody into a cycle that pulls them closer to the cross, not pushes them further away. I don't want to judge. Nobody I know has ever been judged closer to Jesus. But they have been loved closer to Jesus. One is a cycle of I'm going to break down everything you do based on action rather than the other cycle is I'm going to love you and hold your hand and walk with you no matter what. Because I'm not fighting you, I'm fighting a principality of darkness. Are you with me today? Some of you are like, this is getting weird. No, it's not. This is truth right here. Because here's what the enemy wants us to believe. The enemy wants us to think that we're fighting the person. Because it gets the attention off of him. Because if I'm fighting you, and I think if I tear you down enough, then I've won. And then we haven't won because what happens every single time? Now we're stuck in a cycle of attack and when I've defeated you it's no longer enough so now I move to you because I don't agree with you and now I move to you because I don't and the more here watch the longer the cycle goes the more it moves up the ranks of leadership because if the enemy can strike the head he can kill the entire body and so some of us the problem isn't your boss it's that you've gotten used to backstabbing your coworkers, And now you think nobody knows anything better than you. If I can strike the head, then I can kill the body. I don't know why I'm hitting on this so hard today. 
That's why, that's why families are under attack today. That's why more, there are, this is a fatherless generation. If I can attack the head, that's why men don't know how to love women anymore. That's why I struggle showing my emotions to my wife about how much I love her. That's why when I get mad, I have a hard time holding it into her. But I can go to my friend who ticks me off and wrap my arms around him and love him. But when she does something against me, God bless, we're going into World War III. Y'all don't act like you're holier than me. Because if I could strike the head, then the entire body has to fall. We got to understand we're not fighting each other. We're fighting principalities that are trying to win in this thing. And so I want to look real quick in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Is this helping anybody already today? 1 Samuel chapter 17. Chamuel, I guess is the way we say that now. 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, 31 through 40. And, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. Y'all go read that portion of Scripture by yourself. But there's three, three quick things in, in those portions of Scriptures that if we're going to love people to life, we've got to pay attention to. And the first one is this. If we're going to love people to life, we have to embrace responsibility. We have to embrace responsibility. Look at somebody and say, it's your call. Look at the other person and say, now it's your call. Because it's all of our call. It's all of our responsibility. It's all of our purpose. Verses 31 and 32 of 1 Samuel 17. you got to be able to laugh at yourself. It says this. When the words which David were, uh, spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Here's what happened. David shows up. There's an entire army of Israelites standing before the Philistine Goliath, and they're all standing there, and they're staring at the guy, and Goliath comes out every single day. Ho, 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 send me somebody to fight. Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, oh. ho, Whatever he does, I don't know. And he says these things. He's like, come and fight me. And an entire army is so paralyzed by fear, they can't move forward. The king's like, look, I'll bribe every one of you. I'll give you this and I'll give you that if you'll just go fight him. And nobody wants to fight him. This little shepherd boy shows up with cheese and bread for his brothers. And walks up and he hears this big giant of a man walk up and go, Hey, I'm going to kill you. And then he turns and I can see it as clear as day. As the giant shows up, he probably hears him. He's like, man, you're a punk. And then he turns and he looks at the army to see how they're going to respond. And every one of them are standing there going, I don't want nothing to do with that guy. He's big. And I can see, I can see David. It says he, he ran to the battle line. If you read, read, read back, it says he ran to the battle line. Here's what that means. He literally ran to the line where the soldiers were standing to fight. He was standing in a position to where the only people that were supposed to be there were the ones that were going to do something about it. But the problem was he was looking to his left, he was looking to his right, he was looking behind him and he was going, where's the person that's going to do something? And I feel like that if I'm going to be honest in this world today. We got churches that meet all over the place. And we got Christians all over the world. And then we look and go, the enemy is coming to us going, I'm going to destroy this, and y'all come fight me if you dare. I'm going to destroy your political system. I'm going to destroy your church influence. I'm going to destroy your reputation. I'm going to do this. I'm going to destroy your marriage, blah, blah, blah. And everybody's going, huh? Ah! And sometimes I feel like I'm watching the battle before you. And I'm looking to my left going, what you going to do? And I'm looking to my right, and I see lines of people standing there paralyzed in fear. And I want to look and go, what are you doing? Do something about it. How long are you going to stand at the place where you can battle and let somebody threaten your life and you not do a doggone thing about it? David got sick of it. David looked at and saw, and he goes, hey, your servant, the one that brought the cheese and the bread? Hey, you know the little boy that you passed up on, but you took my brothers as a part of your army? You know the guy that you said was too weak and too small because I couldn't do five bench presses? I couldn't do one pull up? And I hated the treadmill? Hey, you know the one that you said needed to stay tending sheep rather than fighting giants? The rest of them? 
are pansies and they're scared to death. I'll do something about it. Saul looks at him and goes, you're too small, man. Too feeble. You can't do that. And Saul, I love David. He goes, your servant will go. The least of these on the battle line will go. When we pass responsibility, we pass on our victory. We live in such a world today to where we want the victory but not the responsibility. We live in such a world today that those of us growing up that are, that are younger and, and, and trying to run, run the gamut of the corporate ladder and provide for our families, we want what our parents got, but it took them 80 years to get there, and we want to get there as soon as we graduate high school. I want, I want the five-bedroom house on 20 acres of land with two garages, a pond, a bass boat, a Ford Raptor. I want all this stuff. I don't want to have to work when I don't want to work. I want this and I want that. And everybody wants the victory, but nobody wants the responsibility that comes with it. That's why most of us want the wealth, but we don't want the budget. That's why most of us want the health, but we don't want a gym membership. Forget a gym membership. Go on Netflix and look up a workout video. My God. Come on. We want the victory. The Israelites are standing on the battle line. They didn't want to lose the fight. Because if they lost the fight, they lost the place. They lost their land. They lost their placement. They lost everything. But none of them wanted the responsibility to be the one to do it. Let me give you this thought today. Nothing extraordinary ever happens until we get tired of the ordinary. Extraordinary is just the ordinary with a little extra on top. Most of us are like, I want an extraordinary marriage, I want extraordinary kids, I want an extraordinary family, I want an extraordinary church, but don't you dare ask me to serve. My kids play travel ball, and I ain't setting up pipe and drape. Then don't complain about the state of which things are in. I want my family to be loving. I want my, my family to, to be disciplined and, and to love God, but I'm not. we're going to go to church based on how we feel on Sunday morning. Not based on a discipline of spiritual renewal. Well, well, don't complain when your kids grow up and see no value in church. I want my kids to grow up and know how good God is. But don't ask me to stop talking about how bad people are. Any, anybody? Y'all got quite, woo! I love you. <laughs> David was disturbed. By the lack of responsibility. And he got up and he did something about it. Maybe what disturbs you is the place that is calling out your destiny. Maybe you're disturbed by certain things in this church and in this world because maybe that's God going, it's your destiny to do something about it. Bishop Tony Miller, a great mentor of mine said something like this to me recently he said when God wants to get something in the earth he develops it within people God needed a, a godly leader and king for Israel but he couldn't put a king in there that didn't have any battle experience so David goes and kills a lion and a bear that attacks his sheep steps up and kills a giant serves the king and a few years later, after running through the hills and the valleys, he's appointed king. And now, all of a sudden, he's seen as a conqueror and not a shepherd boy. Why? Because several years before, God needed to raise up a king for Israel. And so he manifested it through a man named David. Anybody following me? The problem may not be what disturbs you. The problem may be that you let it disturb you, but you don't put any action to it. Somebody needs to take responsibility. Somebody needs to take responsibility for their coworkers and their neighbors. Somebody needs to take responsibility for their church and their life group. Somebody needs to take responsibility for people in this county that don't know Jesus. Somebody needs to take responsibility for the crimes and addictions that are taking place here. 
Somebody needs to take responsibility. The second thing is this. I'm going to go quickly now. We have to embrace experiences. We have to embrace experiences. And if you look back, and then you see where David began to kill a bear and a lion. In verse 37, it says, And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, May go and may the Lord be with you. In other words, Saul looked at him and said, Your past experiences have prepared you for a current battle. We have to embrace experiences. Every single person that we engage in life, every single person that we come into contact with in life, every single person that you talk to today, every single person you see at Food Lion and Walmart is battling something you know nothing about. They're not mad at you because you got their burger order wrong. They're mad because they just found out their spouse is cheating on them. They're not mad at you for cutting them off in, in traffic. They're mad because they know that if something happens to their vehicle, they don't have the money to fix it. Come on. Every person in this world is battling something we don't know anything about. But because we can't embrace experiences, we can't fathom that somebody else may be going through hell other than us. And so I judge you based off of what you've done because I'm going through something harder than you are even though I don't know what you're going through. Anybody in the room? David said, I, listen, I killed a bear and I killed a lion. I don't know about you. But if somebody came to me and they had just killed a bear and a lion with their bare hands, I'm getting out of the way. He said, he said of this, he said, I grabbed him by the beard. I grabbed. <laughs> Have y'all seen those lions at the zoo? He said, get over here. Bah! Poked him in the eyeballs. He looked at a bear and he was like, you can eat me if you want, but you're going to go through me to get to my sheep. Where are the people that are willing to fight when it seems like there's no victory on the other side? Because my experience is preparing me for something better. What I'm going through today, here's what you got to understand. It's easy for us to recite Romans 8.28 over us. God, it's a hard time in my life. But I know that you said you work all things together for the good of those who love you. And God, you know I love you. I haven't been that committed, but you know I love you. We've all said it. I've said it. It's easy for us in our hard times to say that. It's difficult for me to look at you when I'm mad at you and go, God, I don't know what they're dealing with and what their experiences are right now, but I know that you work all things together for the good of those who love you. So first of all, God, I pray that they love you, and if they don't, that you would convict their heart and pull their spirit closer to you. And secondly, I pray that they would see that their experience is setting them up for a victory in the future. And what I'm going through is not hell. What I'm going through is preparation. God, there's a, there's a lion and there's a bear trying to attack my family. Grab that thing by the beard, throw him against a tree, kick him in the gut, and dare him to come back. Because your past experiences, we have to embrace our experiences. I, I find it interesting that in 1 Samuel, you don't have to turn here, just write this down. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 9, David's running from King Saul. He's already defeated Goliath. He's running from King Saul. He's looking for help and, and protection from David and his men. And in, in, in verse Samuel chapter 21, verse 9, it says, then the priest said to David, the, uh, David comes to him, he's like, you have a weapon that I don't have anything. Can you help me? He said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take for there is no other accepted here. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. In other words, when David had no protection, it was the battle and the victory of his past that provided his current protection. What if what you deem hell is providing the weapon you need for the future? What if the responsibility you take today is providing a relationship that you need to help you get to the next level? What if 
What if it's not the battle? What if it's the victory on the other side? The third thing we have to understand, so we have to embrace responsibility. We have to embrace experiences. And the third thing is we have to embrace what we have. Are you following me today? Is this helping anybody? Come on. Embrace what you have. Verse 40 takes place, and I was really going to preach the whole message on this, but I decided not to. It says, uh, so to back it up, David doesn't have any armor. He's going to fight Goliath. Saul looks at him and goes, I'm going to give you my armor. I'm going to give you my sword. He puts it on. He takes it off. He said, I can't go with these. I haven't tested them. They don't fit. Verse 40, (laughs) he takes off the king's armor. And it says, he took his stick in his hand. And he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had. Even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand. And he approached the Philistine. He took off the king's armor, which was probably stronger than anybody else's armor on the battlefield. And he said, no, 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 I can't go with this because this hasn't been tested. I can't walk around in this. This isn't comfortable. I can't move. I can't do anything. Let me go back to where God has, what God has prepared me with. Because what he's prepared me with, what I'm comfortable with, what he's placed in my hand, what I know that I can do is a sling and a stone. And with the power of God, I can take what he's placed in my hand and I can kill a giant in my life. And I don't have to bow down to him and be paralyzed with fear. Instead, I can stand up and go, you know what, God, you gave me love. You gave me a job. You're paying my bills. You gave me a church. You gave me a life group. You gave me everything. Whatever's in my hand, I can defeat any giant before me because it's not my power and by my strength. It is by the power of God and the empowering of the Holy Spirit anyway. He said, hey, I don't need, Saul, listen, no no offense. I don't need your armor. I need his power. For years, I've been in a field practicing against a tree. For years, I've been in a field killing lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Let me go back to what I know is strong because I know God has blessed me there with what's in my hand. So many of us walk around and we're so fixated on what everybody else has in their hand that we haven't even mastered how to use what's in ours. We want the family everybody else has. So I haven't learned how to raise mine. I want the wealth everybody else has so I haven't learned how to steward mine I I want the popularity that they I want the here's what you got to know in order to love people to life you don't need a microphone you need a voice in 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 order for people to come into your life to tell about Jesus you don't need more friends you you need people that you work with you know what I'm saying like you you don't have to be in a place to where I need more no 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 you need to embrace what you have because the Bible tells me when I steward what I have then I'm blessed with more then I get the upgraded slingshot I ain't got to sling it I got the one that's got the armband right there and it, it embraces it for me and then I go from that to a red rider BB gun and then I go from that I got what I need because I'm stewarding what I have Stop wishing you had what everybody else has and embrace what you've been given. If we want to love people to life, we got to quit complaining about the life we have and start loving the life that they're not yet living. I, 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 look, I, ah, I look at some people and they're like, I really want to tell people about the goodness of Jesus. And I'm like, that's great, go do it. And then I watched their life and I'm like, why would anybody think Jesus is good when the way you talk about his kids is never good? Jesus forgave me. He loves me. But they're a sack of trash that he did nothing for. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. What if I said, no, 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 no. We're all marred by the hurt and the pain of sin and we all walk in the power and the goodness of the grace and the mercy 
in the forgiveness of Jesus. And because of that, you're not trash. You're a child. And we can love each other through our disagreements and through our problems and through our bitterness. Are you with me today? We're zombie fighters not because we're great. We're zombie fighters because there's something in us that provides the cure for everybody else. And his name is Jesus. <laughs> Nothing else. So, God has given you exactly the people and the things you need in your life to love people to life. There's just one question. Will you do it? Will you you're like, don't ask me that question. No, 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 no. I have no choice but to ask you that question. Right where you are. I don't care what you did last night. Forget that junk. Because you're about to accept Jesus and your life's about to turn around forever anyway. Will you, in your mess, embrace the responsibility? Will you say, I'm tired of standing on the battle line and watching everybody else die. It's time that somebody steps up and does something. I'm tired of going through this. I'm tired of going through that because I'm here to tell you this. This world needs what's in you. God needed something in the earth and so he's, he's purposing it through you. Will you embrace the responsibility? Will you bow your heads with me today? Because some of you are in the room and you're like, I've never heard it that way. I've never thought that I was good enough. I never thought that I was loved enough to be called by God. I never thought that I could have a, a plan in this whole part, uh, part in this whole story of God. I never thought any of that. And, and today I just believe that I do. And, and I've heard about a God that loves me no matter where I am. And I want to accept the, here's the thing, your grandparents and your parents didn't accept the responsibility of your salvation. That's only you, yours. Nobody can pray that prayer and live that life but you. So you're sitting there and you're going, I, 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 heard about, I heard about a God today that loves me and I want to walk that out. I want to give him my life. And that's the first responsibility that I need to take because there's something in my life that needs to come out of me because God loves me that much. I'm tired of standing on the battle line and waiting on somebody else. If that's you and you've never given your life to Jesus and you need to pray that prayer of forgiveness and submission today, nobody's going to look around. Nobody's going to embarrass you. And what we are going to do is ask you to do one thing. I'm just going to ask you if you want to pray that prayer to repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you everything that I am. I give you my sin. I give you my past. I give you my present. I give you my future. Because Jesus, I ask for your forgiveness. Walk with me. Empower me. I accept the responsibility of my eternal destination. And it is through the cross that I get to a place where I have forgiveness with the Father. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for welcoming me into a new family. If you prayed that prayer, every eye closed, every head bowed. If you prayed that prayer, will you do something for me? Will you hold your hand up really high right where you are so that I can put something in your hand and walk this journey with you today? Yeah, we want to walk this out with you. You're not alone. This is a family. We do this together. And when you feel that clipboard slip in your hand, you may grasp it and you may put it down and then you can fill that out and turn it into the Connect Center on the way out. But here's what I want you to know. Radiate Church, I think we need to make some noise for one person that entered the kingdom of God in the house today. Two. Sorry, two. I want to pray with you, but I'm going to leave you with this thought. Will I embrace the responsibility today and every day. Father, we honor you. We praise you. We honor you. God, help us to love people to life. We are not walking this life as zombies that are dead. We are walking this life that, with, as people that are full of purpose and abundant love. God, we honor you, praise you, and today we say we accept the responsibility. It is ours, and God, move through us in your name. Amen.